Um, so you've had a, you've had a chance to relax and enjoy the ship. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And now is it your first crossing? This is the first crossing of the Queen Mary. Um, but I've done I, we did um, two crossings on the QE2 okay. some years ago. Okay, in the same format. Yeah, exactly the same. I mean, in, in many ways, it's very very similar experience. Okay, okay. In terms of you know the kind of feeling of being at sea. And, I, I overheard you talking with her outside, and there is a real spirit of the ship and a camaraderie. There's so many passengers that have taken it yeah. uh, many times. Someone had been on 18. Uh, I think, yeah, the or something like that. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I genuinely think that the most outstanding experience I've had on the ship is the friendliness of it at all levels, from all people being, you know, both people who are paid to come on and people who are being paid to, to be here. Right, and right. after all, all the rest of us. And um, I mean, I've never known s such uniformly cheerful, agreeable, unforced feeling. It's very natural. It's, it's very natural. It's interesting. Uh, so they're either extremely well trained or they yeah. really are very nice, happy people that are well looked after. Yeah. But I do think that it, <coughs> that translates into a happy atmosphere for the passengers. It, it's something to, uh, to, to write about, maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but to, to start off, thanks again for taking the time. Uh, we're from a website called Literary Traveler. And that's all about writers right, and right. places that they travel. And so we're here on the ship and, and showcasing the trip and the fact that, that you're here and, and Joanne Harris is here. So we just want to ask you a few questions, a little bit about your writing, about what the experience is like for you on the ship. Sure. Maybe throw a few baseball questions in there if we can. OK, yeah, I'm always happy to talk yeah. baseball. Well, well great. So, so you grew up in, in the Midwest, and you your, your, both your parents were writers, were journalists, right? And so, who was the biggest influence on, for you as growing up and, and becoming a writer? Was it your parents? Was it Mark Twain? Was it you know, it was, well, it was, it was both of it was both of my parents together. They both were, were newspaper people, as you say. My my dad was a sports writer, and and uh, my mother wrote the home furnishings column for both for the Des Moines Register. And so newspapers was, you know, it was the family business. It's what got talked about around the dinner table. And, and so it, was, it never occurred to me to do anything else other than work in, in newspapers in some capacity when I grew up. English was the only thing I was any good at in school anyway. So it was, I mean, it honestly never entered my mind at any point that I would ever do anything other than make a living from manipulating words in some way. And, and, and was there a writer, uh, aside from your folks, that had a big influence on you? Well, I think my, my, my dad had a great collection, uh, uh, it seemed to me at the time, an enormous collection of, of hardback books, from mostly from the, the, the 30s and 40s, a lot of Book of the Month Club stuff. And, and that included a lot of books by P.G. Woodhouse, funny books by P.G. Woodhouse, and books by people like James Thurber and Robert Benchley, and also a lot of S.J. Perlman. So there's four people I've just named really, really funny writers. And, and I picked up those books when I was you know, 13, 14, started reading without knowing anything at all about these people. And fell in love with the idea of, of being able to use the language uh, as a way of making people laugh by telling stories or telling essays. And, you know, um, and I just really liked the idea of being funny as a writer. Now, now, this next question may sound funny, but uh, uh, hearing you, you talk and knowing a little bit about your work and your, and your background, this, this seems like a perfect place for you, the, the, the middle of the ocean. <laughs> and, and, and I mean that with all respect. No, 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 I know but, exactly what you're saying, yeah. But the fact that you have, in a way, a captive audience of folks that are almost, I think, equal part, there's equal amount of British folks or people from the UK and equal amount of folks from uh, the US. And I wanted to know, what, what's that experience like for you? I mean, in terms of, is this the perfect place for you? Well, I'm very comfortable you? with both, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I really am genuinely and literally at home with both cultures. You know, America's the one I grew up with. It's where, you know, it's where all my formative experiences were. I have, so when you, you know, when I talk to an American, I can talk really, you know, very intimately about, about things like American history and baseball and, and, and those the cultural things, you know, I'm absolutely attached to because that's that's was my grounding. That's what I grew up with. Britain, on the other hand, I've lived in, you know, in one way or another. I mean, I've been there pretty much continuously for over 35 years now. So, an awful lot of my life, more than half of my life, has been spent in in Britain. So, I although I had none of the formative experiences there, I've never had a day of education in Britain, for instance. 
Um, I, I, you know, a, a great deal of my life has been spent there, so I'm obviously very much at home there too. And, I, and because it's you know, the most recent 35 years that have been spent there, I, I, I probably am de facto English now in, in most senses. I mean, I've just lived there so long. It's, it's been my home for so long. My wife and kids are, are English. So in, in terms of just the kind of thinking, my sensibilities, they're pretty well English now. Do, do you find that one group reacts to uh, your work differently? Do, they, do, do the Americans like the travel books? Do, do the British folks like the, the books more? Not about? exactly, except that everybody likes books that's, that are about them. So, I mean, the books of mine that have done, done the best in America are the books like, and you've got here one of my memoir about growing up in Iowa. Um, that seemed to resonate with Americans, and particularly Americans of my generation, more than it did with, with Britons. And, and the, other, the other book of mine that's done really well in America is A Walk in the Woods, which is about hiking the Appalachian Trail. I mean, those books did, did, did okay, but I mean, they did perfectly fine in Britain, but they didn't sell in the same kind of numbers. Whereas the books that are sold to Britain, in particular, was Notes from a Small Island, which is about Britain. And, and about me traveling around Britain. So it's, I suppose it's natural that people are most interested in the things that are about them, about the worlds that they're familiar with. Right, right. In a way, everyone likes to talk about themselves, although they, sure. might not, they may not know it. Uh, with your background in journalism and now the way, we oftentimes will hear how the technology, the internet, has made this giant shift in, in journalism and in print and things are dying down. And then, and in a way, that's a sad thing, but it's also, I think, depending on perspective, can be a good thing. And, and I wanted to ask you, maybe from the the sports writer perspective, or sort of thinking, you know, being paying attention to that world, do you feel that the the technological shift in journalism now, do you feel that that's better for something like sports writing, where you have the opportunity to you know, read and and, and check the scores. I can find out what's happening back in Boston, where I'm from today, and the playoffs are starting, even though the Red Sox aren't, aren't in them. So it's just, if from the sports uh, writer, from the, the descending from one, and, and paying attention to, what do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, no, I mean, the, 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 the fact that, that all information is immediately available now that is, is really very, very convenient. I mean, it's hard to argue with that. Somebody came up to me, some English person came to me quite excitedly the other day and said that England had just won the Ryder Cup. I mean, they had just won, Europe had just won the Ryder Cup. And I mean, this was, you know, the last time I was on, a, on, a, on Atlantic Crossing, you couldn't get that. I mean, the, the satellites, the channels went blank once, once you sort of left port. And so, I mean, the, all of this, this technology is racing ahead. It is very nice to be able to be plugged into the world. I mean, I've been emailing my kids, so we know they're fine, everything is, you know, there's a great deal of comfort in that. But also at the same time, there's a, for me, there's a kind of sadness in that, just in that rushing forward. And it means that because we're, everything is available right now, in this instant, then there's a sort of, we don't seem to have the, the amount of reflective, the reflection that we once had. And I quite like, there's something nice about a, you know, an event happening today, but then you read about it tomorrow morning at the breakfast table. There's something, in, you know, there's so something, just something kind of good about that separation between the immediacy of an event and, and a more reflective way of looking at it the next morning. I, and, and so I would hate to have a world in which there wasn't a newspaper at the breakfast table. You know, even though the news is going to be slightly dated compared with digital formats by the time you actually open it up, there is something nice about having a more leisurely, relaxed look at, What's been you know, the analysis and everything it just seems a bit less. That that element is missing. I think the time the, yeah. the, 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 when when news uh, breaks, it's such a rush to get it out. But to, to kind of keep you on baseball a little bit, you had mentioned that uh, you were a great friend of baseball, and, and many folks uh, know that. In, in terms of like, we write a lot about place and how the, that inspired the writer and so forth. And I'm wondering if, if you had a favorite ballpark or there's uh, one that means a lot to you. Well, in terms of, you know, I, 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 because I, I moved to, Eng, uh, to New England in, in 1995 and lived in, in New Hampshire for eight years, I became a Red Sox fan by, by default. Right. Right? And you can't live in New England and not be, become a Red Sox fan. I grew up as a St. Louis Cardinals fan in the Midwest. 
so Fenway Park has a real kind of hold for me. I mean, I think it's, I, I, it's it, when you go there, it feels venerable and good. And, and, and it feels, you know, you feel like this is the park that Babe Ruth played in, and Ted Williams, and all of these people. I mean, it feels like there's history there. And there's, there's hardly any parks left now that, that you know, that, that is still the same park that there were in Wigan Field and Fenway. I don't think there's much else left now. That really goes back to sort of Ted Williams days, and or, or you know Ernie Banks and people like that. So there's, Fenway it, it, is important to me, but but probably the part that's most important to me of all is the one in Des Moines, Iowa, which was it was called Sec Taylor Stadium when I was was growing up. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure what it's called. It's got a, like it's named after an insurance company or something. So they've changed the name, <coughs> but it's where the Des Moines has a AAA baseball team, which is. Uh, the AAA Farm Club of, of the Chicago Cubs now, and I spent a lot of my life watching minor league baseball in, in that park. And in a lot of ways, I mean, minor league baseball is is an incomparable experience because there's an intimacy about it. There's a kind of coziness about it. You know, that I don't know what the capacity of that ballpark was, but it probably wasn't more than eighty nine thousand people. So you were really close to the field. You could almost talk to the players. You, know, and this, you felt that really you could certainly hear them. Very clearly, uh, you could hear. You know, they were arguing at the plate with the umpire. You could hear every word that was said, and all that kind of stuff. In a way, that, so there was just something kind of wonderful about that. I think that would be the place that I would be most emotionally attached to. And, and that's sort of a follow-up to my next question: that if you could play, where would you play, and what 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 position would you play? Oh well, I, I mean, I, I played shortstop in Little League when I was growing up, and I suppose in my fantasy life, I would always think of myself as. A, as a shortstop, uh, uh, and anywhere to play anywhere in, in, in major leagues, um, I, I j just you know that that it, what wonderful experience it must be to you know on a June evening as the sun is going down to step out onto one of these green grassy spaces and, yeah. and actually get to run out onto a field to be part of that. I mean it must be the most thrilling thing for a kid who's dreamed of doing it. I and mean, I think that is something that just that is extremely special about baseball is that sense of place and sense of occasion. That uh, you know, I I just I, I just think that must be more. You must feel that more, much more powerfully in a, in a baseball park. You know, the, the Fenway Park is very different from Comiskey Park, or from you know, all the all the parks are very very different in a way that I think I can't imagine it would be the same for football stadiums or basketball courts. They must all they must all seem kind of all the same. Yeah, I think there's the, not the, the romance that's certainly what I'm that's, you know, to say. Yeah, I want you to think you said very well. Uh, not to, I mean, I, I, I know we could talk probably about baseball all, all day, but uh, I, I wanted to talk more a little bit about uh, travel writing. I had a question. You mentioned something very interesting in your talk the other day that, that as you started to make your way in, in travel writing, that it was kind of a great scam. <laughs> 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 It when you get to travel and somebody pays you to do it, that's a, that's you know that's a legal scam. But it's a scam. It's a fake one. Well, and, and I think it's it's true what you said, but I think at the same time with your work, you're doing things that are in a way there's an ordinary aspect to it. But then there's this: you could get attacked by a bear, or you could crash a plane, or you could get bitten by a snake. And in a way, you kind of put yourself out there and say, hey, here's what I'm going to do, and here's all the things that could go wrong. But then you do it anyway. <laughs> And I think that gives you a, a kind of credibility and authenticity. And I think, do you think people respond to that and they relate to you and they sort of say, that's, that's how I would be if I were to do it? Well, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not very good at it. I mean, I'm really not, genuinely not a, a, a born natural traveler or, or adventurer or any of those things. And I'm full of admiration for people who are. I mean, there's a kind of long, long tradition of British travel writers being, you know, that kind of Thomas Mallory trekking up Everest kind of people, I and mean, being brave and and you know going to difficult places, and there's still there's still an awful lot of that out there, and and I you know I wish I could be, I wish I was more virile, brave, <laughs> bold, but I'm not, and so I mean so the travel books that I do are a lot more kind of uh, cautious and confused, and and I do think I mean it wasn't a plan, but I do think that people recognize that and respond to that as something that they can kind of identify with because I think that's the way most of us are when we travel. 
mean, the average person when we, when we travel, it, you know, we really enjoy it. I mean, most people really enjoy it, and, and you're glad you're doing it and everything. But there's also a sort of an element of always somewhere, a little, a little element of anxiety somewhere, because things can go wrong, and what if I miss my flight, or what if I get to the station and I can't figure out which platform my train is going to, because all the writing is in Chinese or Cyrillic or something. You know, there's always, and there's always just kind of elements of anxiousness about, about an awful lot of travel. Even this kind of simplest, most straightforward travel, there's always the, oh, what if I get seasick? What if, you know? And, and I think that actually adds to the experience a lot. But, it's, but it, so it means that travel is, is this combination, for most people, of real stimulation and very exciting and everything, but, but mixed up with a little degrees of kind of worry and fretting. Right, right. I, I kept thinking as we, we came to England, I said, well, I don't want to miss the boat, and that just has a literal, <laughs> real literal um, meaning, so there's definitely... Well, you're leaving, you're, you know, you're leaving your comfort zone, you're not, you're, you know, well, I like the food, well, I, you know, will, will I be able to get what I need, you know, just, have I got all my prescription medicines, you know, just all those kinds of things, you're sort of leaving the world that you know and you're comfortable in, and that, in a way, that is... I mean, that is part of the excitement of travel, but it's also, it, it makes, for, for all of us, it makes any kind of travel a little bit of an adventure. I would agree. Now, um, as far as where you go next, is there a place that you would always wanted to, to go that you haven't gone to yet? That you, I mean, not even to write about necessarily, but just to, to visit? Yeah, there's millions of places that I've never been I would love to go. And, 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 and then the, right, I've never been to China, I've never been to Russia. I've never been to India, but those are three right there. <coughs> I haven't really been, I mean, there's lots and lots of parts of South America and Africa that I haven't been to. So there's, there's lots and there's lots and lots of worlds that I would love to go and see. In terms of places I'd like to go and write about, the one that I'm, I'm, I always talk about, and it really is sincere, is I would love to go and, and do a book on Canada one day. But nobody wants a book on Canada. <laughs> I thought about that when I heard you say that, and I thought, like, some reason, uh, go, yeah, was, uh, go just like that. Kennedy sort of famous as a, as a kind of kiss of death as a, as, a, as a topic. But I just love the idea of, you know, if you grow up in the United States, there's this whole country on top of us, I mean, it's just, that we know almost nothing about. I mean, I bet 98% like of Americans, if you just stop them randomly, couldn't tell you who the Prime Minister of Canada is right now. And, and, and would be struggling to, you know, name an awful lot of other facts about Canada. I mean, could you name all of the provinces all the way across? I couldn't. I mean, I could, I, I could name them all, but I'm not sure I could put them in the right order. But, you know, right. I get kind of confused in the middle. Right. And, um, and, and I'm somebody who really, you know, spent a lot of time in Canada, really like it. But most people, I think, most people in the United States know almost nothing about Canada, except that it's a nice place and they're nice people. And we don't need to worry about them. They're not going to attack us. <laughs> we're, safe. we're safe from them. And, and that, you know, they're good friends and good neighbors and all of that. And I just think that's kind of, Wonderful, but, I, but I'd love to go up and just find out what they're doing with the object. Okay. okay, well that's good. Well, that's a, we may get a lot of ideas for <laughs> what, to, what to cover. In terms of if you were to take a trip and, and now, or you let's say you were going to a desert island and you were going to be there for, for some time, maybe let's say six months or a year, and you had to bring one book with you, what, what book would you bring that would satisfy you there? keep you interested that you would want, even if you just read it over and over again. Oh, well, that's, I, I, I actually was asked this question once. Well, there's, a, there's a radio program in Britain, which is, oh, it's okay. called Desert Island Discs, and, oh, you, okay. and, you, and you choose ten, ten songs that you would take with you on a desert island, and you talk about them. And then at the end of the program, famously, they, each week, they, they allow you to take one book with you, um, but you can't take the Bible, and you can't take the collective books of William Shakespeare. Because okay. otherwise, everyone would choose one or the other. And, and so I actually had to think about that, that question really hard. And, and I actually suggested that I would take my own first book, The Lost Continent, which sounds very vain, but it's not because I want to read it, it's because I'd love to have a chance to rewrite it. But I'd love to have it. I mean, I can't think of any book that, any one book that I'd want to read over and over and over again. I mean, I think it would drive you completely crazy if you were stuck for the rest of your life with just this one book. But at least with that, it would give me, I think I would get more, more pastime of it by trying to study it and rewrite it, get it, get it better at this time. Now, now that you're involved in, well, you've been involved but in, with, with academia, in, in terms of what do you think, you're known as a traveler, but what do you think is more important to encourage 
uh, students today? Is it to, to travel more, to see things and experience things, or is it to, to read more? Uh, I mean, it, it, the obvious answer is both. But I, I wonder from your perspective, having traveled, having written, being such a reader, what do you think? I think, I think, I think travel more. I mean, if I can't have, if I can't say both, I would say travel more because first of all, it's a lot easier to do now than, than it used to be. It's a lot cheaper. It's a lot more accessible. I mean, when I was, you know, twenty and going to Europe, it was a huge investment. It was a big thing. It was a kind of a once in a lifetime thing. It was very, very expensive to get over there. Now, you know, I mean, everybody can afford cheap flights and, and all of that, and. And I, I just think, you know, it is an amazing world out there, and, and young people have m much more opportunity to travel and, and experience it. And I think they could learn a lot by it. You know, you can learn, I always feel that everywhere I go, it's, not, it's never a waste of time, because, because you either learn, you find things that other people do better than where you come from, or, or worse than where you come from. But both of those are really quite instructive, you know. And I think, I always think it's interesting, when you go to places, and, I mean, you go to Paris and you see all these sidewalk cafes. You think, why don't we do this right? You know, why don't we have sidewalk cafes in Des Moines, Iowa? It was because it's such a cool thing. It's so sophisticated and just really, really nice. You know, everywhere in Des Moines, I was remember, everybody was just hid behind air conditioning. But there's something nice about being out on the street, you know, drinking and talking and, and everything. But there's other places you go and things are really, they seem really kind of dopey. And, and I think. It's, it, that's, that's very instructive too. You just think, well, why do they do that this way? Why do they eat those foods? I mean, I, you know, and, and I just think it's such, it makes you appreciate what you've got from wherever it is you're coming from a lot more. You see both the flaws in it and realize that no place is perfect, but you also see that sometimes you often see that there are things that are really good about where you come from that you hadn't appreciated because you would always take them for granted. You can't get that from books, you have to get that from personal experience. Right, right. That's, a, that's a great answer. Uh, in, in terms of, of this crossing and your time on board, is there some, do you have a memorable uh, experience? I know that it's been just seeing the reception that you received from uh, folks that, that wanted a, a signing. And I wonder if, is, is, every, is every signing like that for you, where there's hundreds of folks that show up? No, no, not by any means. And it wasn't very long ago, you know. Readings to six people in Boston, you know, Dublin, <laughs> Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and uh, so, so to have um, a lot of people turn up for a reading or you know, a, a lecture is, is you know, it's, it's really very nice and very flattering, and um, and then if they want to come and talk afterwards, that's that's even, even more flattering. So that was that was very good, and, and and it went well, and people seemed to have a good time, and you know, and they made me feel welcome, and I enjoyed it, and everything. So. That doesn't always necessarily happen. I mean, usually those are pretty good experiences, but just sometimes people are a little bit half asleep, or it's not, and it doesn't always work out as well as you, you want to. So when it goes well, it's very, very gratifying. Now, when you're on when you're on the sea, you mentioned you've taken a couple of other crossings. Do you find it inspiring? Do you want to sit down and, and write? Do you feel? Uh, the juices flow, so to speak, or do you just uh, want to relax? And well, it's very it? nice. I mean, on this on this crossing, as I was saying to you, my wife is with me, and, and so it's a, it's a very rare chance for us just to be alone together uh, for for five or six days, which is quite wonderful because there's no phone calls, no interruptions. You know, it's just the two of us, and and that is 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 really really good and enjoyable. The thing that I think is absolutely special about about going to sea in a ship is it's the only way you can really, really realize just how big the oceans are, you know. I mean, we, we fly over, we all fly over the Atlantic Ocean again and again, and, it, and, it, and you know it's big, but it's, but it's sort of hours big. But when you go on a ship, it, it suddenly becomes days big. And, and every single time, for, you know, for, for five or six days, every single time you look out, do a 360 degree turn, there's nothing there but water as far as you can see. And I think every, every human being ought to, certainly everybody on the ship, ought to be kind of compelled to go to the rail and just kind of drink in that very fact because it is, it is so amazing how much of Earth is just filled with water and not with any usable land for us. And because we live on the land, we tend to be, not to, not to think about the seas. And yet we, you know, as, as beings, we're extremely dependent on the seas for all kinds of things to regulate. 
environment and to provide us with food and all kinds of things. And we take that for granted. And I think we do so very much at our peril. It's, it's true. It's true. We don't think a lot about that. This has been great, Bill. I, I, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, with us. And one kind of last question was, you mentioned in the movie uh, the version that, that might happen for a walk in, a walk in the woods that, that Robert uh, Redford might play you. Do you have any instinct on who would play uh, cats? <laughs> <laughs> no, they've, they've, they've mentioned many, many names at various times. And it's really, I mean, they need they, they needed to be somebody who's a, of an age with, with Robert Redford. And that was he was he was you know it was going to be the, the sort of um, with, with Paul Newman it was going to be the kind of Butch and Sundance thing again and it would have been wonderful I mean I think they would have been great together and he was very worried that it was getting too far away from the fact that you know, Katz and I were both in our forties when, when we started off and, and, and Redford and, and Paul Newman were both you know, well into their sixties and and he was worried about that but I didn't think it, I didn't think that mattered at all as long as you got two people from the same generation, and uh, it doesn't matter whether they're in their 30s or 40s or 60s or 80s. So I, I think they, you know, my advice to them, not that they're asking for it, would be just, you know, they need to find somebody who would, would, could walk comfortably with Robert Redford, and then, um, that's all you need. Right. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Yeah.